Hi everyone, my name is Chris Johnson and I am an individual. Hi Roger, it's nice to see you. Um, I'm part of Pints with the Pack who meets to discuss positive masculinities and things that affect everyone things that affect everyone. And I'd just like to start this morning by acknowledging uh, the nations or honoring the nations. And so we acknowledge the land and ancestors of the first peoples who walked this land before us, respect the descendants who walked this land with us and the futures who will walk when we are gone. Sanare is situated on Treaty 7 and Treaty 4 territory, traditional lands of the Siksika the Blackfoot, the Kainai Blood, the Pekani, the Stony Nakoda, Tutina, the Cree, the Sioux, Assiniboia, the Salto Bands of the Ojibwe peoples. These are also the homelands of the Métis people. And of course, we are all treaty people. It was um, two nations coming together. So thank you so, so much for joining us today in this beautiful space or this beautiful virtual space as it is. And I am so pleased to welcome to our men's speaker series, Jonathan Reed. And Jonathan's going to present to us on fostering positive masculinities with boys. And just a little bit about Jonathan. This is why I come into work so I can have all the screens with all the documents to slide all over the place so that I don't mess up his bio. It's it's Sunday and you know, I quit coffee. So <laughs> I don't I wonder how long I can write out that excuse. Um, so a little bit with Jonathan. Of course I had it all prepped and now I've got to find him. Here he is. Um, Jonathan is Next Gen Men's Youth Program Manager and um, some of the this program is pretty neat, some of the stuff that Next Gen Men is putting out. Jonathan organized, facilitates Next Gen Men's Boys programs and collaborates with parents, schools and community partners. Jonathan has a Bachelor's of Art and Bachelor of Education and is currently pursuing a Master's of Education focused on boyhood masculinities. That's got to be amazingly interesting. With a background in activism, he seeks to empower young people to think critically and make their voices heard. Jonathan is a longtime advocate for LGBTQ plus youth and has years of experience working with boys to define, to expand definitions of masculinity, to share boys' stories. Jonathan created a podcast called Breaking the Boy Code, and you can find it at breakingtheboycode.com. So I'd love to introduce Jonathan here and just hand the floor over to Jonathan. And thank you so much, Joan Jonathan, for joining us on this um, snowy Sunday morning. So over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Apologies for typing during my bio. Um, I'll talk about this later um, in our time together. But one of the things that Next Gen Men does and is doing is a Discord server that's a positive space for young adolescent boys. And a few of them... Uh, during that introduction, started saying good morning to each other. And I was like, oh, geez, I don't want to be uh, distracted by Discord. So I was just saying, hey, guys, I'm doing a presentation about voice and masculinity. If you're curious to see how brilliant I am. And then I shut down Discord. So that was my distracted face during my introduction. Yeah, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to share some of my passion with the rest of the world. And uh, I don't have too much to say about myself other than that. Um, as you listen to me, you're going to hear passion. You might see my husky come in. And uh, I feel like I was going to say one other thing, but I guess I'll leave it at that. Um, so I'm going to start, start by sharing my screen. And actually, the very first thing, before I even share my screen, I was going to share my screen first. But the very first thing I'm going to do is start with a slam poem. And I use slam poetry rarely, um, but I use it very sort of intentionally. And one of the things that I use it for is to ground space. And often when I'm working with boys, a slam poem, and if you haven't heard of slam poetry, you're about to experience it, but it's sort of this like edgy, attitudinal, like blast of passion. And so when I'm doing a keynote presentation with boys or young men, or we're doing a workshop together, um, sometimes I bring out a poem to yeah, just to sort of bring them to where I'm at and to capture their attention, which is what I will do with you right now. So this poem is called Boys Don't Cry. I originally wrote it inspired by a young guy named Luke. 
and um, and he's part of the part of the poem. You'll sort of hear part of his voice in the poem. And I I uh, then I had a kid named Robbie say, "Hey, what was that poem that you performed for us once?" I'm doing a school project, and I <laughs> I'm so, I got told to find a poem, and I want to do yours. And so I updated it and fixed it up a little bit and sent it on to Robbie. So this poem is called "Boys Don't Cry," and uh, here we go. Me and a boy were talking about some real shit. I mean, hard shit, like how he wanted to die and he said, stop it, you're making me cry. I said, what's wrong with that? He said everything. I said, name one thing, he told me two. I am not a girl and I am not a baby. I thought, there it is. The tough love line we hear from our mothers, we tell our best friends and we tell our little brothers, but as often as we say it, it's still a lie. Just three words, boys don't cry. He said, it's like you prove you're a boy when you prove what you're not. Well, I got caught a lot, so I got taught that you cannot walk like, talk like, fight like, write like, dress like a girl, or you're less like a boy, and more like someone who ought to get beat up. And he shrugs his shoulders like, I don't make the rules, but I don't fuck with fools who don't know the way to avoid getting called a bitch is to not get emotional in the first place. It's the first taste of the pace of the ways we embrace the violence that we think is our best protection, like flexing. I'll roll up the heart on my sleeve to show you the scar on my... Uh, lost my spot. Scar, show you the scar. I believe that you know where this one is from. That fight where I fought, where I might have not been so quick, quite so quick to fit this fist like a fix for that first taste of violence, but I had to. There's too much to lose. And boys gotta prove what we're not. So I'll bluff like a blackjack, call back past the fact that this mask, asking, this act is a mask and that's all it ever was. And stop talking to me like I've got tears in my eyes because I'm not a girl and boys don't. Yeah. He said, there's one other thing you should understand. It's that every young boy wants to be a man. There's a presence of lessons in adolescence. Like when my grade school grad class asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? And my only answer was honestly, big. It's important to recognize because they don't just tell you boys don't cry. They say big boys don't. And then they say you're big or you're worthless. So I know it's worth this. So I hold this surface tension, attention, prevention. Let me be real clear. The only thing I'm getting off my chest is a bench press. What makes a man? Muscle. We're taught to forget that the heart is a muscle too. Like I'll become man enough to withstand enough. I understand that my hands are commanding enough. I grow up with this, so I show up with this split lit bullshit. Hit me any way you want. Just don't acknowledge my feelings. And when I'm a man, I won't still wonder why. The first thing I learned is that boys don't. You get it. I said, yeah, I get it. I'm also a guy, but listen, I'm telling you, every boy cries, it's a fact, right? But you act, right? If nothing else, wear your mask, right? But it's like this, you start, you can't fight this apart and you gotta let somebody else in your heart. I mean, real shit, hard shit. Trust them and be who you are. Quit telling me this doesn't matter. You matter. And that's not poetry, that's a full sentence. So when you say, stop it, you're making me cry. You decide to try to lie, deny the inside. Your implied pride is leading to the biggest killer of boys and young men, suicide. And that comes from somewhere. And that brings me back to that tough love line we heard from our mothers. We told our best friends and we told our little brothers. But as often as we said it, it was always a lie. Let's change just one word. Boys do cry. And that is the end. So thank you for listening uh, and being part of that. And thank you for being here. Uh, as I'll talk about, like, I think it's really, really, really critical that Adults, parents, educators, caregivers are doing really great work with boys and attending to boys with sensitivity and commitment. So that's what we're going to be talking about for the next about 40, 45 minutes. And I'm probably going to turn on and off screen sharing um, like here and there because uh, the slides are not super important. Um, but there are some pieces that I want you to see. So I might, I might come and go with the screen sharing. I'm going to now just quickly tell you a little bit more about myself. So my name is Jonathan and, uh, I work for next gen and I've, I've been working with next gen for the, about the past three years. And, um, I am immersed in my life's passion. I also create this podcast called breaking the boy code. I just finished a session with the national youth working group on gender equality with the department of winter and gender equality in the government of Canada. And I'm part of the youth reference group of the global men engaged secretariat. So I do lots of work with boys and young men in bringing that question or that conversation of what does masculinity and positive masculinity look like in the gender justice movement? Um, that's the whole shindig. This is a photo of me with a group of young guys as part of the Next Gen Men program. And 
Uh, you can see that we're celebrating Movember. I'm not currently able to really grow that great of a mustache, but then again, neither are 12 and 13 year old boys. So we threw on some fake mustaches and talked a bit about mental health and men's well-being. What I'm going to do for this session is uh, I was trying to think of like, what's my favorite way to like, how do I want to ground in this conversation? And I've done it in different ways. My goal is always to not bore my audience, but not bore myself. I'm not really one of those speakers that can say the same thing over and over again for presentation after presentation. So for this one, I decided I would do four myths. I just wrote a blog post where I did like a true and false thing about boys online relationships. And I kind of liked that, that sort of structure. And I decided to roll with it for this, this presentation as well. So what we're going to do is go through four myths together. Each myth has a bit of a story, has a bit of research, and, and then at the end of that, hopefully you've picked up something, you know, or had a question come to mind that I can sort of contribute an answer to at the end of our time together. So without further ado, the first myth, kablam, masculinity is toxic. And obviously what I'm referring to here is toxic masculinity, um, but... I guess what I'll start by saying is that I have another slam poem that uh, has a line, violence is on either side of us, not inside of us. So I'll say that one more time. Violence is on either side of us, not inside of us. And that's kind of what I'm getting, to, getting at when I talk about masculinity itself is not being toxic. There's a little bit more to it. And to sort of get to that, I'll tell you the story of a Next Gen Men lunch program that I was doing I guess it was two years ago, it might even been longer ago, but it was in the wake of the St. Michael's College School. Um, I don't know if I'd say incident. If you haven't heard of it, if you're not from Toronto, uh, it was in the news. Again, I can't even remember how many years ago, but this private school, an all boys school in Toronto that um, came to light that a couple of their sports teams, their football team and basketball team had um, allegations of not just hazing, but sexual assault. And there was like police involvement in that kind of thing. But the, the, the really, I guess the shocking thing for a lot of people was the realization of the levels of both physical, sexual, and then like emotional violence that could be happening unnoticed or perhaps noticed and unprevented. Um, and so there's these conversations about masculinity, about bullying prevention, and about engaging boys and young men as leaders in the spaces um, where they're alone. Um, to prevent violence and to stand up for the right thing. So that kind of conversation was happening in this lunch program. It was at a completely different school, but it was boys who had heard of what was happening. I came up in conversation and I talked a little bit about it. And one of the boys said, we don't need to talk about this. None of us here would ever do something like that. And I said to him, I believe you. I think you're probably right about that. But I think that boys in a different space would also say that and they might not really be aware of what they would do when violence actually happened. I said to him, things that are, uh, one thing that I forgot to say this, one thing they said to me is we're not broken. And I said to him, things that are broken are things that need to be fixed. And I don't really think of you as something that needs to be fixed, but I do think of you as the best chance of preventing violence before it happens. And I guess that was my way of like responding to like defensiveness in that situation. He was saying that story doesn't apply to us. So we don't need to talk about it. And in my perspective, it does matter to talk about that kind of thing. It also matters to be able to see both the best in boys and to see the potential for violence within cultures of masculinity. And the way that I see both of those things at the same time is like, if we look at this myth, I don't see masculinity as toxic, but I do see it um, as another phrase, which I did not really articulate this in my favorite way, but the phrase that I use that I think of most commonly is precarious masculinity. Rather than toxic masculinity, thinking of masculinity as something that has to be proven. I didn't come up with the term precarious masculinity. It came from a couple other researchers. Um, the idea is thinking about masculinity as something that has to be proven, that you have to um, not just like grow into, but as you grow into it, you need to bolster your image as a boy or as a young man. And you have to prove to other people because at any time your masculine status or your identity could be called into question. And that's where we hear things like, don't be a girl, don't be a pussy, you're such a bitch. Like those sorts of words that are really about undermining or 
tearing down boys' masculinity that are using femininity and misogyny to do that. So if we think of masculinity as something that's precarious, not something as that, some, not something as that is toxic, that means that it's not in masculinity, it's not in boys themselves that harm happens, but in the choices and actions that they make in order to prove themselves as boys and young men. And it's worth pointing out that the way that they prove themselves is within a culture that we all know celebrates aggression, dominance, heterosexuality, invulnerability as like elements of masculinity. And so um, in the rest of this quote from Judy Chu, and I can share where it came from uh, later, she says, so if we think about a boy that is trying to be independent, one way that harm happens if, if he goes so far in that direction of like independence and invulnerability that he ends up actually isolated and um, cut off from systems of support that could help him through whatever he's going through. Or we see someone who um, is trying to prove themselves as confident and they end up like actually like getting into this like system of like objectification and um, trying to overpower or like wheel like girls and um, women in the context of like hooking up into that kind of relationship. And so these are ways that boys can make choices to prove themselves as men that actually cause harm. And that's actually not an inherent thing that they have to do. They can prove themselves in other ways because masculinity can be enacted in positive and supportive and uplifting ways. I'm kind of rusty on that. Like, I think I've articulated that in more effective ways in the past, <laughs> but I hope that you picked that up. And if any part of that was confusing, let me know. The second one that I wanted to talk about um, is vulnerability. I think we can see this myth in a lot of different places in our culture. We see it in like superhero movies. We see it in um, kids at the skate park. And it's something that boys pick up themselves and they start to um, realize those expectations that the, both their peers, their parents and the broader world have about them. And that's kind of part of, for example, what inspired me to write this poem that I shared at the start, Boys Don't Cry, like that. When I do stuff about like, okay, when I talk with grade seven and grade eight boys, what are the, and ask them, what are some of the, like the, the most common messages about masculinity that you get? Like the one that always comes up is boys don't cry. As much as that sometimes feels like it's com a completely outdated element of masculinity, it's super present in boys' lives. They know that expectation that the world has of them. And it also affects the, the, way, the way that we think about boys. So when I was thinking about this myth and thinking about this example, actually what came to mind was um, something that happened like earlier on Thursday when I was preparing this presentation. And so first of all, the, the background knowledge that you need is that Next Gen Men runs a Discord server. I normally run school-based programs, often after-school programs, usually with grade seven and grade eight boys, um, talking about things like mental health, healthy relationships, gender equality, and um, those sorts of things. And schools have basically been close to external organizations since last spring. So we've been piloting, experimenting, and sort of trailblazing different elements of online youth facilitation. And one of the things that we picked up was Discord. Young people are using Discord regularly to um, communicate with each other, to build community with each other, to find places of belonging. And so Next Gen Men started developing a space that we walled off from the rest of the world. And we said, this is a safe space. Everyone in this space is verified. So we know, in fact, they are grade seven, grade eight, and grade nine boys. And within this space, we're going to have a set of norms that ensure that they're positively interacting with each other and not um, using like inappropriate offensive or like demeaning language. So it's a place where boys can feel belonging, feel safe and build friendships. And it's called Next Gen Men Boys Club. Part of the onboarding process for Next Gen Men Boys Club is that I talk with anybody who wants to join and we go back and forth a little bit and um, ultimately have a conversation on the phone or on a voice call to um, learn a little, bit of a little bit more about them and to ensure that they are in fact who they say they are. And so two boys joined last week, Matthew and Dinar, and those are fake names. Um, but to give you a bit of the story, so Matthew joined first. He was like, this is actually a pretty fun time. And he invited his friend Dinar. 
So Matthew was already part of the server and I was going through the onboarding process with Dinar. And in our conversation together, he was pretty sh like short spoken. He really didn't say much. He was giving me like one word answers. He was like almost standoffish or um, not quite surly, but like in that direction where I was really hard to get anything out of him. And I ended up feeling, um, I was like, does this kid even want to be here? Like, does he think I'm a complete waste of time? Um, is he like overall just kind of a jerk? Like, I didn't really know what to make of him. But we went through our conversation together and um, knowing that he was a friend of someone who had already been part of the server and in conversation with me, um, added him to the server. And a few hours later, Matthew messaged me and said, Dinara thinks you're pretty scary. And I don't know, I, in watching me do this like webinar, you might, I hope that I'm coming across as like pretty gregarious and friendly. And so I was kind of shocked. I was like, Dan, Dinar thinks I'm scary. Okay. Um, do you know why? And Matthew said, well, he's, first of all, he's, I, he's more shy than I am. Um, so more shy than Matthew. And Matthew said, honestly, I was nervous too. And um, so we talked a bit about like, what's nervous about that? And he was like, dude, it's just time. Like do having an interview with, on, with your voice and like on a video call with somebody that you don't know, like that's scary. You're an adult, <laughs> that's scary. And we're just kids. And for me, it was a good reminder that boys don't easily acknowledge feelings of vulnerability. Um, and they still might feel them and they might feel them really significantly. So just to wrap up that story, like over the next couple of days and still right now, I'm like ensuring that I'm saying really positive, um, complimentary things to Dinar so that he knows, Hey, I think really well of you. And, um, and I'm not, and I'm not trying to, you know, be scary or intimidating. Like I'm ensuring to like feed him those pieces of positivity in order to build our relationship. Um, but to go back to sort of the theory of it, like what we also see is not just boys experiencing feelings of vulnerability, but overcompensating them to protect themselves, basically. And that's kind of what potentially was going on with the NAR, where he was um, coming across as like indifferent, you know, and over and, and confident and um, uh, even like that kind of standoff. It's like those are barriers that protect boys from acknowledging or expressing their vulnerability. It's kind of the idea that a best, the best defense is a good offense. I forgot to share this quote. I was going to share this while I was talking so I wouldn't have to like dwell on it, but I want to get to the next slide. So I'll quickly share. This is like my, one of my favorite analogies that I came up with when I was talking about somebody else and I wrote this into an article. Is that if you think a boy who has been in a fist fight isn't hurting, try punching something with an unprotected fist. Um, and I kind of came across that idea in talking with boys who had been through physical altercations and were like, man, that was a, that was scary. Um, I'm uncomfortable. I think I'm gonna get in trouble. And also I'm like physically in, in a not good situation. So yeah, but anyway, so the research that I wanted to share was uh, this research project, which was done by the man box um, or the men's project. The research project was called the man box. It was done by the men's project in Australia. And what they did is they did this survey with um, adolescent boys and young men and basically ended up sorting everybody that had filled out the survey into, do you really adhere to the man box or to these standards of like invulnerability, dominance, aggression, being tough, being a man? Like, do you really buy into that? And do you think of yourselves as like, the only way you can be a man is by doing all these like, I could say like normative or like traditional aspects of masculinity in terms of like being tough and being dominant and vulnerable and all that kind of thing. So do you adhere to that or are you completely liberated from that? And do you think of masculinity in more like comprehensive and open-ended ways? And they sorted them from like most adherence to the man box, least adherent to the man box. And so that's what we're looking at when we look at this table um, at the top in orange is stuck in the man box and at the bottom is free of the man box. And then they looked at the responses to other questions in that survey and other pieces of that research and started looking at the differences. And 
Um, and it's kind of remarkable. And I, this was like, like a few years ago and I've still held on to this. I still talk about it because it was one of the most eye opening things. When we talk about boys overcompensating for feelings of vulnerability, um, or going on the offense and, and sort of showing themselves off or building into this, like these like different, like violent norms. Like the reason that matters is this research right here, because the boys who are free of the man box are what well, we could do either 19 or 27% are having thoughts of suicide versus 64% are having thoughts of suicide. Like there's this drastic change. And I used to know like the ratios, which would make it a little bit easier to explain verbally, but you can just see there's a huge drop in their mental struggles or a huge, another way would say it would be a huge rise in mental wellness for those who are free of the man box. And these statistics are even more remarkable if it's all right to say that so um a couple that i usually highlight i'm sorry i'm looking over here now because i'm looking at the research on my computer screen but um perpetration of physical bullying and experiences of physical bullying dropped from 71 and 76 percent to 5 and 12 percent sexual harassment drops from 70 percent in the last month to three percent in the last month like those are massive changes in the ways that boys experience themselves and enact their masculinity towards other people. And so that for me is like a really um, grounding piece of research as to, okay, why does boys' vulnerability matter? Why is it important to give them spaces to explore like alternative, alternative definitions and roots in their masculinity to like the typical be tough, be a man, be dominant and all that kind of thing. This is the research that tells me why that matters. And in terms of how this happens, that brings us to myth number three, that boys are disinterested in relationships. It can be sort of easy to buy into boys' masks and take them at face value. Um, there is a quote from Dan, Dan Kindlin and Michael Thompson. I might've messed up those names, but they, at some point, something that they wrote, they said, it is vital that parents and teachers do not, sorry, that parents and teachers do not take boys at face value, even though they sometimes insist furiously that we do so. I love that quote because it, it both like demonstrates the importance of our role as parents and educators to look beyond that mask, you know, and try to uncover what the feelings are underneath it, as well as acknowledging how tough boys sometimes make that, that they sometimes try really hard to project that mask and to make it all that we can access. So as it was mentioned previously, I created a podcast called Breaking the Boy Code. It's been on a bit of a hiatus throughout COVID because of the amount of screen time that I'm experiencing, but it's this really meaningful, ongoing, long-term project centering boys' voices and conversations about masculinity, about gender justice. And the idea is that if we um, give boys a chance to talk and we actually listen to them, we'll learn a lot. And one of the things that I've learned through this project is how central friendships are to boys. There has been, um, there's an episode of There's a Boy um, that I'm connected with who talked about like juvenile detention and he talked about, um, yeah, like, like issues related to like juvenile crime and drug use. That conversation was really about friendship and how much his most meaningful or his closest friendship meant to him. There was a boy who talked about um, moving across the country from one end of the United States to another, moving from a public school to a private school and the stress involved in finding belonging in a new place. And that story came down to friendship. Uh, there was a boy who talked about Islamophobia and racism and um, like gun violence and stereotypes about um, Muslims and um, people who look like him. And that conversation came down to friendship. And so there's basically what I've experienced is that so many facets of boys' lives and their feelings, and especially the difficult things that they go through, the most important thing to them in those experiences is their closest, um, most trusting friendships. And first of all, friendship isn't 
um, just like a nice, like feel good thing to have, but the best system boys have for resisting harms related to norms of masculinity. Um, Judy Chu, who's that researcher that I showed that first thing about, um, and she's talking about precarious masculinity. She did a different research project where she um, found that, yeah, friendship was sort of the difference maker for boys that were um, committed to re like resisting harmful norms of masculinity, having a supportive friend made all the difference um, in terms of them accessing the, um, yeah, like the positive elements of that resistance. Um, another example, I just, so I mentioned this already, but I just wrote this blog post that was like true or false. And it's about boys navigating online relationships safely. And one of the like, um, light bulb moments for me in writing that was I was writing about the internet and talking about how the internet structurally is actually like designed to radicalize boys in the way that algorithms work in the way that sub communities, uh, things like Reddit, um, or 4chan work in like online commenting, all those things build, um, systems for normalizing extremism and violence and that kind of thing. But then I said, let's be really clear. The internet itself does not turn into bo turn boys into like white supremacists any more than like violent video games turn boys into school shooters. The roots of violence in boys' lives are their relationships and whether or not they are held and known by caring and positive role models and peers. Because if boys are left isolated or feeling misunderstood by the natural supports that they should be able to access and rely on, that's where they start to, um, yeah, like build in more like aggression and violence and um, both towards themselves and towards the people around them. And then the last thing that I wanted to say about relationships is that this isn't just about peer relationships. Peer relationships are critical to adolescent boys, but they're not the um, only kind of relationship in boys' lives. And I know that I talk a lot about research, but <laughs> to me, research like informs what I do and how I do it. So um, another piece of research that I found really, really eye-opening and thought-provoking was by these two um, educators, Michael Reichert and Richard Holly. They got tasked by the International Boys School, School Boys Coalition, some sort of uh, boys school coalition to research, okay, what are the effective teaching strategies for engaging boys in the classroom? And they did this giant survey where they reached out to all these different teachers across the world and all these different boys across the world, like thousands. And they found that almost all of the teachers responded to, to the question, how has like effective learning happened in your classroom by talking about really great lesson plans and technical aspects to their teaching about engaging boys with like drama, you know, or expertise um, or like teamwork and collaboration or competition, these different elements that were really centered like externally from the teachers, but in that space between them and their students, this is what I did in a really great lesson. And what they found, and that was interesting on its own, but what they found was boys responded to these surveys by writing like deeply eloquently and in great detail about the relational aspects of their teachers, the qualities that the teachers had to relate to them as an individual, to see value in them, to let them feel cared for and known. And so they would, even when they were told, like, please don't tell us like details about your teachers, they would say, like, my coach, like Mr. So-and-so did this, this, and this, and that made me feel this, this, and that about him. And um, so their takeaway was that, yes, there are really great strategies that we can, like, mobilize in terms of engaging boys and really all students in our classrooms, but the center of boys' educational experiences is the relationships with their educators. And um, they said like the more that we talked with boys and the more that we like looked into this, we found that it is less how a boy learns, but for whom he will learn. And I think that extends not just to teachers, but to parents um, and other like adults, coaches, youth workers in boys' lives. It's sometimes less about what you're saying, but how you're saying it. It's less about what you do and more about who you are. And so that's the other piece to relationship. And so when I think about like those, um, those boys on the Discord server who I'm working hard, right, to create like, relationship with, like that's not for no reason, but because in the context and in the medium of relational connection with boys, 
um, both among themselves and with me as a positive role model and someone who's working really closely on things like positive masculinity and gender equality, that's where transformation is going to happen. It doesn't happen in a textbook. It doesn't happen um, in uh, I'll say it anyway. I was like, as I went to say this, I was like, I shouldn't say this, but I'll say it anyway. It doesn't happen. Like transformation doesn't happen in a Zoom webinar. It happens in our relationships with each other. And I don't mean that the Zoom webinar is a waste of time. This is a critical opportunity for people to connect with each other and learn, right? But the work that we do is in relationship with young people that are around us. Hopefully that was all right to say. Uh, and this brings me to myth number four. And a hydration break. Um, I guess myth number four is that there's like, well, I guess I'd just say that there's no point where this is not relevant. Even at a really young age, um, this stuff matters. So personally, part of the reason I care so much about this and part of the reason that like I've centered like my life's work on this is because when I was a kid, I faced this stuff firsthand. And in a lot of ways, I faced this stuff alone. So when I was a kid, I had long hair. I um, had a twin sister. So I had interests that were relatively feminine. Like I played with Barbies, I tried ballet and that kind of thing. Um, I became the first cheerleader in my elementary school that was a boy. And in my childhood, I got told my hair was too long, my shorts were too short, I was standing like a girl, I was talking like a fag, I heard everything. And I got called, I got told constantly that the way I was being a boy was wrong. And so even at a really young age, like I'm talking like, as soon as I started school, I started to experience elements of masculinity around me. I started to be constrained in who I could be and who I couldn't. And I started to think to myself, this isn't actually fair. Like what gives these other boys the right to define who I can be and what I can do? And myself as a young person, I responded to that eventually by kind of being angry about it and being like, no, you don't like, screw you. Like you don't have the right to tell me um, that I can't be myself. But we know that other young people um, and one of the ways I was able to do that was with the support and love and like unconditional like love of my parents. And not everybody ha is blessed to have a family like I did. And so um, one of the like eye opening or like really, really motivating experiences for me is when I was in university, I found out about a young person named Ronan Shimizu, who was a cheerleader. He was 12 years old and he was getting bullied for his gender expression and the way that he was being a boy. And he ended up ending his life. And um, that was like really motivational to me. Or not, motivational is not the right word. It was really, um, hmm, I guess, grounding for me or eye-opening for me because I was 12 and I was a cheerleader and I was getting bullied for the way that I was being a boy. And I didn't die and he did. And um, so all of which is to say, it's like, it's not, you know, it's not too early because if someone had started engaging me and, 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 you know, and other boys in conversations about positive masculinity and like expanding what's allowed for boys and really young people of all genders at a young age, then we might not end up with like these systems and patterns where people get punished for being themselves. Um, there's, again, I know I talk about research a lot, but there's a researcher, Amanda Ketty, who says that like, she's like, Childhood is like not a period of innocence. It's a period where um, even young childhood and like um, preschool and like kindergarten, and all those, those like those moments when, when young people are starting to interact with each other as peers, they, um, they're, they're also practicing picking up and like trying out systems of hierarchy. And to think of childhood as like innocence, um, it's a missed opportunity to engage effectively with young people and help them um, either navigate those hierarchies effectively or challenge them and disrupt them and find like more egalitarian or more justice oriented like ways of being. So childhood is not too early and adulthood is also not set in stone. I am still learning and I'm learning elements to myself and the way that I am a young man. We hear at Next Gen Men, we hear it from um, like retirees who are like, yo, I'm coming across this stuff and 
I, it is making me think all kinds of things. I'm going to get therapy for the next few decades and sort it all out. Um, so it's not too late either. It's always worth having these conversations and it always matters to delve into these topics. And I guess the last story that I wanted to um, say is that one of the ways that we do that most effectively is by letting boys lead the way and giving them space to, um, yeah, like explore what matters to them. And I guess I'll tell this relatively quickly. It's, it might seem kind of irrelevant, but I hope it doesn't. And what it's meant to say is like, this is a, this is one way or an example of how we, um, engage a teenage boy who seems utterly indifferent to things like mental health and well-being. Um, how do you start that conversation with a young person knowing it's not too late, it's not too early, it's really important that I have this conversation, but geez, where do I start? So I probably wouldn't still do this now, but between 2019 and 2020, one of the ways that I grounded a conversation about mental health is by talking about the NBA. Because in the 2019 NBA finals, um, without going into too much detail, LeBron James, um, who's part of the Cleveland Cavaliers, was going against the Golden State Warriors. And in the first game, in the aftermath of the first game, he punched a blackboard. He lost his temper, punched a blackboard, injured his hand, played the next three games without telling a soul that he had an injured hand and lost the next three games straight to completely get swept in the finals and lose. And that story in detail was intimately known, maybe not so much anymore, but in 2019, 2020, every adolescent kid to generalize a little bit that I was talking to knew exactly what had happened in the NBA finals and found it really easy to talk about. And so we would say to each other, okay, what, if you're a professional athlete like LeBron James, what are some of the reasons that you stay silent about something that you're experiencing, specifically an injury? And they would say, well, I wouldn't want to get taken advantage of by the other team. I wouldn't want to let my teammates down. I wouldn't want to be the center of attention for something that I'd, you know, I'd lost my cool um, and different reasons like that. And then we would turn the conversation to, okay, if you're an adolescent boy, what are some of the reasons that you stay silent about something you're going through, something like mental health um, or stress or grief? And the reasons are really pretty much the same. I don't want to be taken advantage of. Um, I don't want to let my friends down or my teammates down. I don't want to be the focal point. I don't want to be the center of attention and have everybody know something that I'm going through or that I lost my cool. And from there, we can delve into this meaningful conversation about our well-being and what it looks like to ask for help. But we didn't start there. We didn't start with that level of vulnerability. We started by talking about basketball. And that's an entry point that worked really effectively and works really effectively with boys. Um, and then leading, letting them lead the way and find insight themselves and guiding them to those mo more, um, more impactful spaces. So that's like an example of what it looks like um, to, yeah, to engage with boys in that way. I'm kind of going to wrap it up there because I want to give space for, for questions and discussion. Um, I'm interested to hear what stories or perspectives or, you know, concerns that you're bringing into this space. And I always like to leave actually enough time, like genuinely enough time to engage some of those questions um, meaningfully. So just to recap, like the four myths, first of all, boys are, and masculinity itself is not toxic, but boys and men do have to prove themselves. And sometimes the way that they prove themselves is by enacting harm either on themselves or others. The second myth was that boys are invulnerable. And we see this in movies, in just like discourse about um, boys and young men. Um, and we know that actually um, boys often cover up really, really deeply felt feelings of vulnerability by overcompensating with either indifference or confidence or aggression or dominance and going that like offensive route for their best defense. And we actually know that boys that are compensating or like projecting typical or normative elements of masculinity, like being tough and being strong are actually the most at risk for harm towards themselves or um, experiencing harm from others or perpetuating harm on others. Um, the third one is that boys are disinterested in relationships. One of the most central things in adolescent boys' lives is their friendships, their peer relationships, specifically those in which they feel trust, um, vulnerability, and they feel well-known. And um, I've had conversation after conversation 
where that that came down to the central piece of what boys were going through. And we also know that boys' friendships um, are alongside boys' relationships with the adults, the educators, parents, and caregivers in their lives who um, are role models and um, that like anchor point as they navigate, I think it was Michael Reichert that used the analogy as they navigate the rough waters of adolescence to have that anchor is really critical. And the last myth was that it's too late the other piece of that is that it's too early. It always matters to have these conversations. Um, even kids at, at really young age are experiencing elements of um, gender hierarchy, um, sexism, and I guess like other elements of oppression as well. And so it's always worth um, talking to them, engaging with them and helping them sort of imagine new possibilities because young people are the ones who are I mean, to be a little bit glib, the most equipped to transform the world in positive ways. Um, and one of the ways that we do that is by um, engaging them in conversation that gives them an entry point and then sort of like gives them space to take that into meaningful ways. So this is my email. If, I have, if you have any questions or you're like, wait, what was that thing again? Um, you can shout me or send me an email, um, Jonathan nextgenmen.ca and nextgenmen. Um, and also I should have, I'm, anyway, so nextgenmen is at nextgenmen. I, I didn't know the social information for Sonare. I'm also not sure how to pronounce that, but um, huge kudos to the people that organized this for organizing it. Um, and I wish I could tell you their social information or how to engage with them, but they can do that potentially in the chat. And I'm going to wrap it up there. So that's the slides. I just realized there's, People that have been saying comments, I've not been looking at the chat for like the next, for the last 45 minutes, but I guess I'll just ask, is there any questions? And maybe somebody who's helping facilitate can help me navigate some questions. Hey, Jonathan, thank you so much. We do have a few questions for you that um, have been popping up. So don't worry, we got you <laughs> when it comes to that. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. Wow, I was like busily copying links and all the things as well. It was um, it was great. Um, so one of the first questions um, is about how can we help young boys at school not give into peer pressure, telling them certain things or actions aren't cool. Cool, great question. Um, so yeah, peer pressure is like central in. Um, the way that young people navigate school um, and other peer environments. Um, it's worth saying there's negative peer pressure. Um, and, you know, I was just talking to a teacher who she, she was like, yeah, I had this group of grade seven boys talking to a group of girls and they just started sort of like, it just sort of like escalated. They started using objectifying and misogynistic language. And it was almost like they were sort of trying it on and seeing how it fit. Um, but the way that that happened was in like that sort of peer pressure kind of going back and forth and escalating into this space that I don't think any of them really intended to take it. Um, and I think anybody that works with boys um, could sort of imagine that kind of thing happening. Um, there's also positive peer pressure and there's young people who um, like have really positive impacts on their friends and um, young people are pretty, pretty aware of both. One of the ways that we talk about it in our Next Gen Men program is by doing um, like a psych psychological experiment where, and this is, this is like, this is from psychology. I don't know where I came across it, but the idea is that there's three lines that are, one of them is like a different size. I don't remember the details, but the idea is that um, you have one person who is not aware of what's going on and everybody else is in on it and everybody else gives the wrong answer. And that one person then has to decide, do I go with the group or do I go with what I think is right? And, um, and it's always a really interesting experiment because it is quite common that they go with the group. Even when they know themselves, this is not the right thing to say or do. I'm going to go with the group because I don't want to be the one person standing on my own. I don't remember the statistics, but it's like two thirds will go with the group or, or like larger. And um, so whether or not, like whatever happens, happens. If sometimes they do stand up and just say, yo, you guys are tripping. Like th this is the correct answer. And sometimes they don't, but either way, it's an interesting discussion. And then the really interesting thing is, again, this is like an actual study. You can find it online or psychological journals or whatever, but they did the, the other thing that they did is they said they had one person give the right answer. So one person in that, like everyone's in on it group 
gives the right answer and says, I don't know, actually, I kind of think it's this one. And what it does is for that one person who doesn't know what's going on, immediately from like one third, it goes to like 99%, they do the right thing and they say the right answer. Because as soon as they've had that one person sort of give them permission or, or sort of blaze the way, it becomes that much easier to, um, to sort of stay true to themselves. And so in our conversation, we, we talk about the statistics um, in both scenarios. And then we talk about what does it take to be that one person? And often it takes just a lot of self-confidence. It takes that grit and resolve and commitment to your own values, but it also requires like a bit of trust in somebody standing with you. And so one of the things that we talk about is, yeah, it actually might be like beyond your wherewithal to stand up um, all alone, but you are always surrounded by peers and usually surrounded by at least one person that you know pretty well. And so let's talk about how do you guys know that if I say something, he's going to stand with me and be that ally in that locker room or that party um, or that group chat. And we kind of talk about, um, yeah, like having friendships or being in spaces where you can um, have that trust in another person to have your back. So that's, that's part of how we talk about positive and negative peer pressure in our, yeah, in our sessions with boys as part of Next Gen Men. And I don't know if that was like an exact answer, but hopefully it'll, it'll jog your imagination and, um, and then the last thing to add is that we always ground our conversations. Sometimes they're theoretical and hypothetical, and then we kind of ground them in, okay, what does that actually look like when you're in that party or in that locker room? Um, but yeah, I'll leave it there. Thanks. That, like, I've definitely read some of that as well. And some of that practicing or going through is actually makes it more likely that people will do the things and will step outside of that packed behavior. So thank you so much for that. Um, So the next question is, hazing has occurred for a long time and continues to be present in locker rooms, et cetera, despite the efforts of coaches and parents and teachers. Um, how can we eliminate it or reduce it? Or is there anything that you can add specific to hazing? Yeah, one of the things that allows hazing to, perpe to perpetrate or to perpetuate is um, is that it's unspoken. It's this invisible subculture that is sometimes known by coaches, um, sometimes not, and um, and it just like flies under the radar. Um, and yeah, like again, I can't remember the exact statistic, but it's something like nine in 10 high school students that witness hazing will not say anything about it. And and that's a huge number. That's not like 50-50. That's almost everybody that sees hazing happening is not, or experiences or perpetuates hazing is not going to say anything about it. And so to me, it comes back to that like relational aspects of um, working with boys. Um, maybe you're not that close or like that well connected with every single kid on the team, but to like have those relationships with a few of them so that you can communicate about like what's actually happening um, and what can I do to like support positive um, cultural development in, um, in our team together, like to have that point of connection with some team members, I think is valuable. The other thing is that hazing often gets justified. In, in both young people and coaches saying it's, it builds like rapport, it builds connection. And um, it's like this tradition that, um, yeah, it's like not so fun in, you know, in the heat of the moment, but it creates a stronger and more unified team. And that is like, that's like how, that's like how like you justify like sending young men into battle sometimes. I guess I won't go there. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> I won't go there. I'm thinking of like history. Um, I have a background in history and I was thinking of like World War One and World War II and that kind of thing, but we'll set that aside. But basically the idea that um, we can build a stronger connection with each other um, is can be a justification for violence. And the reality is that we don't have to um, be violent towards each other to find love. <laughs> Those are completely different elements to ourselves and our relationships and our teams. Um, and they're not, they're not like int as intertwined as those who, um, you know, support or, or endorse hazing would have you believe. And so as, uh, as well as like being connected with and engaging in conversation about like what's going on on, on our team, that I'm not necessarily, what's happening when I'm not supervising them as the coach, I would build systems, you know, and structures and traditions and rituals that do create um, connection and create um, 
vulnerability, like one of the things that hazing does is it creates vulnerability. It creates it in a really aggressive way, but it puts boys in a space where they're vulnerable with each other because of like the violence that they're facing. So I would find rituals that um, give them opportunities, sometimes rituals that are challenging, you know, and sometimes physically challenging or scary or, you know, involving, you know, elements of risk that, you know, as an adult, I'm like mitigating and navigating. Um, but yeah, I guess like what I'm saying is I'd find um, traditions that I can implement that are not leaving um, that task or challenge of building connection or unity in the hands of young people. I would say I'm part of this as your coach. I will find those, I'll build those and I'll build them in collaboration with you, but um, it's not in your hands and it's not invisible or unspoken. Let's do it together. And those, those rituals don't have to be violent. They don't have to be um, exclusive or aggressive. They can still be like challenging, you know, but um, finding that meaning and that connection in ways other than hazing. I think that's what I'd say for that one. I love your answer there. I remember reading or taking a psychology course at one stage in my life and they talked about how in um, westernized culture we've lost all of our rites of passage. And what really what you're talking about is creating a healthy a health or a health well a healthy rites of passage that creates that belonging and that vulnerability as and increases connection and actually thinking about thinking about doing that in a very, very strategic way. And um, that's, I love it. Can't even say much more about it other than I think that's an excellent idea. Excellent idea. Um, so we have some questions about parenting. Um, and one of these questions is, parents are often toward between wanting to let their boys be themselves and protecting them from bullying, or and, and protecting them from bullying from others. What would you tell these parents? Yeah, totally. That's such a um, powerful thing to try to balance. Um, one of the first things that I come to um, is um, I did a podcast episode where I talked to Lori Duran, who has this kid, CJ, who is gender nonconforming. And it was CJ's dad that initially said, back when CJ was really young, CJ's dad said, um, I'm not going to be CJ's first bully. Um, and for me, that was like, I was like, that's a really interesting way to put it. Um, yeah, I know that my, that my kid is going to, is might face bullies, but I'm not going to be one of them. And um, yeah, I think it is, um, it's a natural instinct to, to say, Hey, look, bullies, like, actually, this is in a different poem and I might share this at the end, but there's, there's the, the, one of the things in the poem that I wrote is bullies love difference the same way a gun range likes black silhouettes. And the idea is that, yeah, difference will ostracize you. It'll make you a target. And um, sometimes kids can control that difference about themselves. Sometimes they can't. Um, but um, it might make them a target. And so it, there's this natural instinct for parents to try to say, hey, if we know that you're going to get targeted for this, like, why don't we change it? Or why don't we, like, hide or minimize that part of yourself? And um, I get that instinct. The problem about that instinct is that it, it sort of teaches young people to internalize violence upon themselves because it says to that kid, there's actually something wrong with you. And, um, and so we're going to change that part of yourself rather than give you skills to like negotiate or effectively challenge, or even just like protect yourself from bullying. We're going to try to change you and not change the way that you interact with that or change the systems themselves so that you're better protected. Um, so for example, um, well, okay, this is, I, as I said, for example, I was like, I literally don't have an example in my mind, although I'm sure that any of us could think of like a hundred, but there's, um, literally what popped into my head as a kid I know who plays video games and he plays Call of Duty. And if you haven't heard of Call of Duty, it's a first person shooter game. Um, and um, it's fun. It's, it's not like inherently wrong, but it also has like some, it definitely has people playing on it. And there's like the, that like indoors, like to, like a toxic culture. And um, so there's a lot of negativity and name calling that can happen in Call of Duty. And he, this kid is 13, but he has a really high voice. And I, I was talking to him the other day and he actually had found an app that would make his voice lower so that in he, uh, so that in playing with people he would sound more like a like a teenager rather than a kid and um 
I don't really know where I was going with that example, but um, to me, it was like this interesting, I was like, I, you can't change what your voice sounds like really, except he found a piece of technology that kind of could. And um, okay, but anyway, set that example aside because that's not totally clear what it's exactly teaching. Um, Identity-based bullying is a thing where kids get targeted for some element of their identity, whether it's their race, um, their like ability of their um, socioeconomic status. And I think the, man, in this long rambling, unclear answer, I would say that I would talk really clearly about kids. I would stay connected enough to them to under, to hear their stories of what they're experiencing. And then I would sort of like engage them in, t in conversation about like the structures that are all around us um, of, of like racism and stuff like that and that. And um, I would not try to change them, but I would let them lead the way if they really don't want to wear those earrings because they're constantly getting called gay, then I'd say, it's up to you. Um, but I guess I'd also try to ensure that they have spaces, whether it's in my home or with ideally with other youth and other youth spaces where they can be themselves and not have to hide parts of themselves out of the fear of getting targeted. Yeah, that was a really good question. I've definitely answered that question more clearly. And maybe I'll write a blog, I'll sit down and write a blog post where I answer that <laughs> in a, in a, in a more articulate way. So I appreciate that question. Hopefully that made a bit of sense. It totally made sense. And what I'm hearing you say is that, you know, creating the space for people to be who they are, for ch children to be who they are, creating that space, and then also honoring resilience. Like when that young person you were working with found the app, that's resilience, right? Like he wants to go out and um, he's realizing that, but then he needs a place to deconstruct that. Why did he have to bring that tool in? And um, then how do we work as the collective we to really deconstruct that on a larger scale so that, you know, maybe the next kid doesn't have to find that app. So, you know, no, I think it absolutely made sense to me. Um, the next question is what can a mother or a teacher do to support a boy whose father embraces and models many of these myths? I think this is like the hundred dollar question all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I guess two things come to mind. The first is there's potential there for an alternative role model. Um, so we know there's organizations like Big Brothers, Big Sisters, um, I mean, Next Gen Men, um, and there's, there's, yeah, there's organizations and, or just sports teams or teachers that, um, can offer boys like an alternative, um, to things that they might be learning from their father. Um, and yeah, I don't know if I'd say that so much to like subvert what their father is role modeling for them, but just to offer them like more options in understanding what masculinity and manhood looks like. Um, I also think that like a male, like it's not always necessary that a male role model is the, um, is the be all and end all of boys learning what it means to be a man. Um, I know boys with like single mothers or like really, really talented female teachers who, um, who do have uh, really like long lasting and meaningful impacts on what their boys understand about their own masculinity and sense of themselves as men. Um, yeah. So I, I guess I'd say that, um, yeah, ensuring like ensuring that there's like relationships beyond that, that um, father who's embracing um, norms and myths related to masculinity. And then, I guess this is kind of related, but what comes to mind is like, honestly, like really make sure that that boy feel, feels love. And like when I was a kid, my mom would just literally be like, do I tell you I love you often enough? Like she would, she would ask me that like every now and then. And I would be like, yes, you do. Like what, like what a weird thing to ask. Um, but what comes down to boys um, with fathers who are trying to, yeah, who are sort of teaching or role modeling um, like, more um, 
I guess I'll say like more stereotypical elements of masculinity is like these boys end up really trying to get love from those fathers and to get and get love by basically like mimicking and picking up those like those expectations and putting them on themselves. Um, and um, I think and so, and I think that one of the so what I think one of the most important things that we can do is is ensure that those boys are held that they have a, they have a relationship where they know that they're loved and they can feel that trust and vulnerability with um, yeah, with another adult. Um, there's a kid that I know who um, is um, facing some really difficult situations with his um, parents and um, like for example, he like currently isn't living with his parents and went through something difficult with his dad. And, and he was like, why would, and so in talking to me and I kind of know what's going on, I've been part of that, that family dynamic a little bit. And he was like, why would he, why would he say that to me? And I was like, dude, that is, that is all about him and not about you. And, um, and you should, <laughs> I said, you should not hurt yourself because of it. And he said, I can do what I want. And I said, well, that is true. But what you want is to be loved. And I love you. And then he said, why do you love me and not my dad? And um, yeah, man, that was a really difficult conversation. And I didn't have an easy answer to that, but it was really important that, um, that he felt that and that there was somebody there saying that with him and not, um, and not just sort of like leaving him out to dry. And I know it's important because um, I guess like without going into too much detail, like he put himself in the hospital um, when he was 10 because of that. So yeah. Um, yeah. So I guess I'll say that like, there's lots of other role models in boys' lives, like mothers, teachers, role models, like um, coaches and organizations. Um, and, and also just like at the end of the day, just um, ensure that they feel love and um, And that gives them a better sense and, and that you have a sense of and holding them to like the elements of like the best parts of themselves that, you know, yeah. Wonderful. Um, you know, firstly, that story just touched my heart, right? Like how many um, people haven't heard that I love you or, and had that caring, caring connection. And, um, you know, and are often scared specifically in professional roles to say things like that to kids for other fears and yet to boldly go there because that's what that kid needed, you know, so kudos to you. Kids know when things are going to be okay and not be okay, right? Um, and it just, you know, your point really reminded me to a uh, initiative that our um, Prairie Rose School District locally has put in place when they know a kid is struggling, struggling, they make sure that that child has meaningful interactions every day from the time the bus driver takes the time to say hello to them and acknowledge their existence in a very meaningful way um, and create relationship down from the bus, the the bus driver, the school janitor, it's a whole community and it really takes a whole community. And I think that, you know, when it comes to raising those children, um, it really does take community. It's not just one parent or two parents. It's that community that comes together to care. And really, that's what I'm hearing you say. And that's your message again and again is it's relationship, 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 care and authentically care. Mm -hmm. Authentically care. Um, so thanks for that. Um, you know, um, just another, just another um, question, kind of like springboarding a little bit in relationship to um, your mention of the your young boy who is um, ten who ended up in the hospital in Medicine Hat, and you know this is this has been in the news a lot in our area. In Medicine Hat um, specifically, we've had a large amount of individuals who have um, died by suicide recently. And um, we're also seeing, of course, related to the pandemic, a lot of youth actually, there's been a, a severe uptake in attempts. And, um, and this isn't just happening in Medicine Hat, a severe uptake in attempts and also um, died by suicide. How do we how do we talk to our children about this? Like, how do how do we help them? How do we understand it? And then how do we explain this to our children when this happens? Mm -hmm. 
Um, for what it's worth, like I'll start by saying, like I'm really sorry to hear that. That is um, kind of immeasurably dif difficult. And so, yeah, sending some compassion your way to your self and your community, um, and to who whoever asked that question, like sending you love. Um, it is really, it's actually a really important question. Be, and one of the reasons that it's important is because, um, well, like suicide is really present in, um, in our culture. It's specifically present in young people's lives. It's specifically present in boys' lives. Um, and that's not to like undermine its relevance or importance with any other population. Um, but I guess what I'm getting at is the fact that in 2018, um, suicide was the first and foremost killer of teenage boys in Canada. And that's beyond like car accidents. It's beyond um, cancer. It's beyond anything. Suicide killed more teenage boys in Canada than anything else in 2018. And, um, and yeah, and if you, you might've heard the statistics before, but basically um, one of the things that researchers are finding is that um, yeah, the gendered aspect of suicide is that um, if I've got this right, girls and women typically um, will uh, or will um, go through experiences of incompleted suicide. So what is sometimes called like attempted suicide more often. And, um, but boys and men um, experience, experience suicide with a lot more lethality and die by suicide. Um, Again, I can't. I forget the details, but like, I think it's like three quarters more or something like that. I haven't really talked about these statistics in a while. Um, and there's one other thing that I was going to say. Um, I think what I was getting at there was that 75% of suicides are are men. Um, there's one other thing I was going to say about that. Oh, and then just to, just to touch on the fact that um, there's other populations that are even more vulnerable to um, to suicide, um, including but not limited to like indigenous populations that are experiencing other systemic um, or structural forms of oppression. Um, there's LGBTQ youth, um, specifically LGBTQ youth who are experiencing like ostracizing or um, isolation from their natural supports and their families. So there's, so that's sort of like the other piece of the gendered aspects of suicide um, that, that make it a really critical conversation. Um, but to answer your question, um, which was how do, we under, how do we understand this and how do we explain it to, to our young people? Was that the question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, One way to like under honestly, like they might go hand in hand. Like what's coming to mind for me is that um, young people who are experiencing suicide ideation um, or enacting like suicide upon themselves um, are often experiencing sort of two things. One is that they're at the end of their rope. Um, and the other is that um, they think that no one cares there isn't a soul that cares whether or not they live or die. And sometimes people sort of like denigrate, so they're like, ah, they're looking for attention. And I guess I'll quickly address that by saying, even if that is all they are doing, then let's give them our attention. And, you know, if it's a cry for help, like let's listen really carefully to that cry for help and not like undermine it or look away from it because um, we are like, our instinct is to like invalidate its seriousness. Um, so young people who are at the end of their rope um, or um, feel like nobody cares about them, um, that's like a really tough situation to be in. Um, it um, is often like coupled with mental illness, like depression. And when you're depressed, like it can be really hard to motivate yourself to believe anything's going to work or to put in any amount of effort or energy into um, like relationship or um connecting with somebody. And so you end up kind of isolated from the very supports that could make a difference for your mental health. So it's a really tough sort of cyclical downward spiral. And it can be really, um, obviously really dangerous. Um, 
anyway, so in terms of understanding a young person who feels like they've got no, they've got no, they've got nothing left. They don't have energy in the tank. Um, they don't have any other alternatives that they want to try. And they don't think they have anybody who cares about them. Like, um, I basically think like kind of Chris said, like that <laughs> it's, in, it's in relationship with young people to um, connect with them, to listen to them, not necessarily try to solve their problems, but say, hey, I'm, I'm interested in having this conversation um, with you. Um, and if you are ever, and so I guess I'm, when I'm thinking about this, like I'm thinking about somebody who's not struggling with suicide, but has heard about it in their community or has experienced it in a friend, um, but to say to them, like I, am, like, I am here as a steady resource. I'm your rock. Um, and when you're falling from that rope, like, and you're headed towards rock bottom, like I'm right below you ready to catch you. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and to make it really clear that it doesn't matter like the day or night, it doesn't matter, um, like what they, what they are thinking, but you want to have that conversation with them. Um, and I guess like the last, I know this again, I, I'm, I don't know, I'm not very satisfied with my answers in a lot of <laughs> these and I'm not really satisfied with this one. But the last thing that I'll say um, is young people can kind of underestimate the impact of suicide in my experience. Mm -hmm. And um, having experienced it firsthand, one thing that I sometimes say to young people who are starting to be really serious about suicide ideation is you really don't have a clue. Um, I, I, and I... <laughs> And I, and I find some way to say that with empathy and with, um, and, and not just by telling them, like, you don't know what you're talking about, but I try to say to them, when a young person dies, it's not like things are not neatly wrapped up and, you know, and off and it's, and it's, you know, and everybody lives happily ever after it shatters people. It shatters individuals. It shatters their friends, their parents, their communities. It's not something that people recover from really. I knew a 12 year old who died by suicide. I knew her pretty well. And I still think about her and I still get sad about it. And so I, I kind of say that to young people to sort of give them some perspective as somebody who's experienced it. Um, it, it, um, it is catastrophic and it's not the easy end that, um, or, you know, when young people think that nobody cares, they kind of just think they often say like my family's lives would be easier if I wasn't around, like my friends would be better off if I wasn't around. And, um, and so that's kind of the one of the things, one of the things that I try to challenge most ardently is, uh, no, we're better with you, with you here. We want you here. And, um, and yeah, it's, and that's the verb that I use or the adjective I use is it's shattering. Yeah. I'm going to totally agree with you on that, Jonathan, just, um, you know, working with the community and having some people in my own life who have um, died by suicide or who have attempted. Um, it's really important, firstly, to take any signs or indicators really, really seriously. Kids do not joke about this. Um, we know that now and we know that it, attempts are happening much younger than they used to. So taking it very, very seriously. Um, kids tend to not joke about it. I mean, and there's levels of joking. We know when it's a little bit different and having those really con those conversations with kids when they are, when it seems like they're joking as to what that means. Um, reaching out for resources, Canadian Mental Health it has amazing programs such as Shattered Teddies, which um, really talks about working with kids who um, have a history of, who are at risk of suicidality or who, um, you know, just so that we all have good skills within our toolbox. But I'd really recommend reaching out to Canadian Mental Health and figuring out more because really they are the specialists when it comes to suicide. And again, like just Jonathan, going back to your messaging, which is it's all in a relationship, being in, um, it's all in relationship and being that approachable parent, which as somebody who's raised three kids, I'm, I'm raising my last one, he's 15. And, um, you know, and it started out with, you know, family suppers, talking about things. Um, we'd be in the car. That's another favorite place that I have to talk. And of course, when it was when they were little and it was great and I was driving and I would be like, oh, you know, tell me what you think this song is saying or tell me what that means or what do you think of this? And having those discussions, like all of the discussions that uh, those of us as parents um, want to have. 
in the beginning that was great um, and as they've gotten older now I'm the one sitting there like this trying to not flinch at some of the questions that are coming my way but I'm so glad they're coming to me and I'm so glad they're not going online or they're not going to the parents so um, do do reach out do seek more information like I said Canadian mental health has got lots of stuff out there for you and there are other organizations that deal specifically with mental health, suicidality. Um, yes. Thank you for that, Jonathan. Ah, let's see here. There we go. Um, can you explain? Oh, here's um, here's a bit of like of a softer question because these questions have been deep. We are concerned about our boys. Um, can you explain the activity in the photo with the boxes? Totally. Yeah. And as I started to tell the story about the NDA, I was like, shoot, this is a completely wrong photo. And that's also a pretty good story. So yeah, I'd be happy to I'll sh share the screen. So for those of you that, that missed it, um, this, um, yes, this is a pretty cool activity. It's one of my favorites. Um, so it's based on the rape culture pyramid, um, which is also known as the gender is the gender-based violence pyramid. I didn't come up with this visualization or this concept. I think I came across it from an organization called 11th Principle Consent. Um, but it's simply an, a visualization of sexual violence in our culture. So if you've heard of rape culture, the pyramid is um, a visualization of how those um, elements of violence get normalized um, and then sort of per perpetrated um, in different ways. So you can see at the bottom of this pyramid, there's things like, and again, I'm going to be looking over here because I'm looking at the photo, but there's things like locker room banter, sexist phrases, rape jokes. So these often verbal, often joking um, elements of like sexism and misogyny. And then it escalates to sort of the next form of violence, um, which here the boys have put threats, non-consensual photos and videos um, and victim blaming. And then it escalates to physical sexual assault, drugging and rape. And I first came across this again, like some sort of feminist, I don't really know on the internet, la di da. Um, and I went to tell boys, I was working with grade seven and grade eight boys and I, we were talking about sexual violence and I drew the pyramid on a piece of paper and we talked about it a bit. And then as I reflected on that session, I was like, it's a pyramid. Why on earth did I draw it on a piece of paper? Because if there's one thing we can do about pyramids is you can build them. And so I went to the grocery store. I got, I actually went to a florist and got these giant boxes. You can't really tell, but if you build this well, it's like nine feet tall because um, we put it on a counter and then it's this giant pyramid. And so what I do is I introduce all these different um, things. And often the boys have heard of, you know, rape jokes because they play video games and they've heard of, you know, some like, oh, I totally got raped there. They ha maybe haven't heard of catcalling or they've heard of catcalling and they think it's a good thing. Um, and, um, and often there's one boy who's heard of more than the other. So the first thing that we do is learn about what do these different words mean? And then I get the boys to build the pyramid themselves and they discuss together. No, that should go in the middle. Oh no, that goes on the bottom. And they kind of one by one piece it together. And there's not really like a right or a wrong um, to it, um, but we, they build the pyramid in conversation with each other. And then we talk about what's the connection between like the bottom and the top. Um, and the purpose basically of this visualization with a group of grade seven and grade eight boys is to say, actually rape jokes do matter. You know, and the way that you talk in a locker room does matter, even if you're not serious um, or you're not serious all the time, those things lay the foundation for sexual violence in our culture. And they create a culture in which one in three women in Canada are gonna experience physical sexual violence. And the things that we do right now as young adolescents in terms of like catcalling, having sexist phrases, like those are the foundation for how violence happens. And so they make the connections between the bottom and the top and they find commonalities and there's discussion there. And the other piece to this session is, um, I was just thinking, should I show you the video? Okay, I'll tell you and then I'll find the video while I'm telling you is we then say, well, actually, what does it look like to challenge the things that are on the bottom? And um, what might you say to interrupt a sexist phrase or to say, hey, that's actually not true. And then um, we have one of the boys actually knock it down. And the idea is to empower them to, um, to see themselves as like allies in those spaces and to like actually realize, hey, if I regularly interrupt a rape joke when I'm playing Call of Duty with my friends, 
um, I'm actually destabilizing the entire culture of sexual violence. Um, that again, it's also not just one in three women in, in, in Canada who experience sexual violence, but about one in six, if not more, men who are going to experience physical sexual violence in their lifetime. So here's a quick, I don't know if this is going to display correctly. So he's talking about if one of them falls off, then this whole thing will fall. And I'll just skip ahead. And then this kid is like, oh, he, he throws up his hand. Let me do it. Let me do it. We're saying, we're talking about what does it look like if I interrupt a sexist phrase? <laughs> and you can see that it's like visual, it's dynamic, it's like physical um, and experiential. And yeah, it's like one of my favorite ways to engage boys in that conversation about, I don't know if the video worked, but it's a pretty cool way to engage boys in that conversation about um, what can we do as young adolescents? And particularly because at that point in their lives, like they're not really talking about sexual assault um, or like threatening, but they are experiencing those sexist phrases and locker room ranting, um, locker room banter and all that kind of thing. So. I forgot to mute myself. I was like cheering and giggling, like cheering to myself and giggling, watching it all come down. I was like, yay. <laughs> I oh, love yeah. that. Um, yeah, I loved every second of that, and I loved how experiential it was. Um, so thank you. Um, thank you for that, and thank you for sharing that activity. Um, there's one last thing, just jumping back to that I wanted to say specifically for those people that have children in their lives or individuals in their lives who have attempted or who have died by suicide. Um, we can do everything right as caregivers or as support people, and we can hold the space and we can tell people that they love that um, we love them. We can try to connect them up to resources, but at the end of the day, there is also free will. And so, if something happens, know that you know things do happen, and it's not your fault. So, really, do know that. Really, of course, there's always room for things but we can't go back through the shoulda woulda couldas um, and reach out for help again that's where canadian mental health and your local organizations can really help you with that but um, it, it is not helpful to get stuck in the shoulda woulda couldas it is not helpful at all for anybody so um let me see here um there is one more quote we have like two more minutes and there is one question and that's just, my son was bullied in high school and refuses to talk about it. What can, what as a parent, what can I do? Okay, in two minutes. Um, I think, first of all, I'm not pressuring anybody to tell you something when they don't want to. Um, if he decides that um, he does want to, then uh, by all means, follow that lead. Um, but, um, Adolescents in particular are, are keen about their own space and independence and that kind of thing. Um, if you can figure out what he's getting bullied about um, on your own and then be ensure, and then sort of ensure that you're like bolstering that part of himself. So if he's getting you know bullied for like gender expression, like celebrate that. Um, if he's getting bullied for um, like, I don't know, like an interest in like musicals, like celebrate that and uplift that and support it. Um, and um, I think it might be easier, I guess something with one minute left, like maybe an idea is um, find ways to um, give him um, or ensure that he has, like he does have a, a supportive friendship. Um, and maybe he has one now and that's great. And maybe he needs you to work harder to help him find one in a different space. that's not school, um, but some other place where he can find belonging and find that connection and ensure that there is a peer that he has who knows him and cares about him and likes him just the way that he is. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, bull I got bullied constantly when I was a young person and what kept me grounded was my friendships um, and, and my family's love. So yeah. Um, yeah, I would say that knowing knowing exactly what's going on isn't as important as knowing him and knowing and him knowing that you care about him, um, and 
Um, and it's easier for him to talk about, okay, which friendships does he have that he cares about than it is to talk about how is he getting victimized? So he might be more willing to talk about his friendships that, you know, are, are meaningful. And those are just as important to his well being as what he's experiencing negatively. Um, another kind of thing to throw out there is like, um, young people are pretty reticent often to like engage in therapy, but like therapy can do lots of really cool things with young people. And so, um, encouraging him or talking with him about finding some other sort of support. If he doesn't want to talk about it with you, maybe he wants to talk about it with, you know, or an older sibling, an older sibling who's moved out or with a therapist. Um, and, and yeah, so there's those other support systems as well. Thank you so very much. Um, as, as we go deeper and deeper into this speaker series, the questions are getting deeper and deeper and harder and harder. So Jonathan, you really um, stepped up to the plate with some of these questions and we really appreciate them being asked. We really appreciate these questions being asked because oftentimes it's what we're all thinking um, and we're all wondering. And so to have you come at 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning to meet with us, we're just so very grateful. So very grateful. And thank you to all of you who've um, joined us today, those people who've um, come again on their Sunday morning to learn more about supporting um, healthy masculinity in our young boys. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. I just really want to give a huge shout out to um, Danica, who was yesterday working with our Zoom account <laughs> to try to make sure that this today went off without a um, without a hitch and she got it. So thank you so much, Danica. And thank you to those that have worked with us through all these transitions to get here. Thanks to Next Gen Men. And um, thanks to Pints with the Pack for holding this space. So um, we hope to see you next Sunday at 10 o'clock where Joel, one of our, um, Joel Bosch, one of our Pints with the Pack members will be talking about fatherhood with a few other individuals. And it's going to be amazing. I always enjoy um, hearing Joel's perspective and uh, Joel and others' perspectives on fatherhood. So thank you for all of you that came forward, the vulnerability that I've seen in the chat. And um, we will see you next Sunday. And thanks, Jonathan, for joining us. Take care. Bye, everybody.